Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, a woman renowned for her powers of seduction who would stop at nothing, including murder, to achieve her ends. The career of Cleopatra is one of, uh, of calculation. And in terms of being calculating, she has to be cold-blooded. The dark side sometimes reveals itself. Every source speaks of this type of Cleopatra. A woman who will stop at nothing until she has destroyed everything the Rome holds dear. This is the legend. To find the truth that underlies it, it's necessary to peel back the layers of time to reveal what's real and what's myth. Investigators will put Cleopatra's life under the spotlight using a wide range of scientific tests. They'll reveal how she murdered her entire family in her craving for power. And a leading forensic psychiatrist will put Cleopatra on the couch to explore her dark side and to see how she measures up against other ancients behaving badly. Cleopatra, the last queen of Egypt, has been called the most wanton seductress in history. Driven by power and ambition, her life was saturated in a steamy cocktail of sex and murder. The ancient Roman sources called her an oriental hussy and a whore queen. Cleopatra is fascinating. Since she was one of the few women rulers in the ancient world, I want to look to see how she uses sex, power and assassination to achieve her aims. To get under Cleopatra's skin, psychiatrist David Mallet is going to examine her behavior and then attempt to rank her against other tyrants in history. Like Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, and Emperor Nero. Cleopatra proved she would stop at nothing to gain and hold on to power. She poisoned her 13-year-old brother in her bid to take outright control of Egypt. She had her younger sister murdered in the sanctuary of a temple, which scandalized the entire ancient world. And she seduced the two most powerful men in Rome in her lust for power. But most of these salacious stories about Cleopatra were written by Romans, and they despised her. Cleopatra is represented in the Roman sources as the ultimate seductress, an evil murderer, in their words, a fatal monster, a woman who wants to take over Rome and seduces men so they will do anything for her, contrary to law or nature. To uncover the truth about Egypt's famous queen, we must begin with the events of her childhood. As the daughter of Pharaoh Ptolemy XII, she was well-educated and groomed for power from birth. Over its 300-year rule in Egypt, her dynasty, the Ptolemies, had transformed Egypt into a cultural and economic force in the ancient world. But there was a black side to the family. Internecine murder and incest had been grim facts of life throughout their centuries in charge of eternal Egypt. Her two younger brothers and two sisters jostled like gangsters for control over their country. Occasionally, someone got hurt. In 58 BC, Cleopatra's father is forced to flee Egypt to Rome after a rebellion that had been started by his own daughter, Cleopatra's half-sister. He took Cleopatra, a girl of 11 at the time, with him to Rome. In what was something of a family tradition, in quick succession, Cleopatra's sister ordered the strangulation of her husband, killed her mother, and then ascended the throne. But she was not the only ruthless person in the family, and soon her wickedness caught up with her. Cleopatra's father comes back to Egypt, this time with an army from Rome to help him retake power. And one of the first things he does is execute his own daughter, the one who had started the rebellion against him. Cleopatra grew up in the middle of this blood-soaked family soap opera. Cleopatra, at such a young age, is given a very vivid picture of how to do family politics. You have to kill members of your own family or risk being killed instead. Cleopatra's witnessing of the assassination of her own sister has a profound psychological effect on her. She knows that life is cheap, she knows that you accumulate power at all costs, 
even if it means killing your own family members. That particular lesson hit home, as did another one, as true now as it was then. If you want to succeed in politics, you need powerful friends. Cleopatra is witnessing firsthand Rome's military might and sees what it can do when it's on your side. This has a profound impact upon her. She will never forget this the rest of her life. Cleopatra's father died in 51 BC. As the oldest male, Cleopatra's young brother was anointed pharaoh. And following Egyptian law, Cleopatra became his co-ruler. She was 18, he was 10. That same ancestral law demanded that they were married to each other. According to Ptolemaic tradition, siblings must intermarry to cement their position on the throne. And this is a long-standing pharaonic tradition. But to us, it's perverse. It's revolting. This is incest we're talking about. It wasn't exactly a match made in heaven. True to form, the Ptolemies were soon at each other's throats. Within two years, relations had broken down completely. Cleopatra's brother-husband mounted a coup d'etat and Cleopatra was forced into exile. There's no way Cleopatra would give up Egypt or renounce the throne. She's definitely running for her life. But she's an ambitious person, and the throne is her birthright. So in exile, she's definitely looking for any opportunity to return to Egypt. To do that, she would need powerful assistance, and her childhood experience of exile with her father had taught her where to find it. Although rich grain harvests and the commerce of the port of Alexandria had made Egypt a wealthy country, it was surrounded on all sides by the vast might of Rome, the empire that dominated the ancient world. If Cleopatra could harness Roman interests in Egypt for her own ends, then the country could be hers. And Rome had recently celebrated a new leader, Julius Caesar. He would be the perfect ally. I think she saw Julius Caesar as a vehicle to restore her to power in the same way that the forces earlier of Rome brought her father back using Roman resources. Could she use the lessons learned from her father to gain Rome's influence in support of her own cause? Caesar arrived on the shores of Egypt on the 2nd of October, 48 BC. He was now the most powerful man in the Roman Empire. Cleopatra's experiences with her father had taught her one thing, that you needed Rome on your side if you were going to be on the throne of Egypt. And so that's what Cleopatra did. She went for a once and for all opportunity to get Caesar on her side in her bid for the Egyptian throne. Cleopatra's only chance of retaking Egypt was to obtain Caesar's support and with it the military strength of his legions. What could an exiled queen with few allies do to win the backing of the most powerful man in the world? The answer, she realized, was whatever was necessary. When Julius Caesar, the new master of Rome, arrived in Egypt, he found himself in the middle of a bitter family feud. Cleopatra and her brother-husband were battling for control of the pharaoh's throne. Cleopatra had been exiled to southern Egypt, far from the capital Alexandria. She decided that if she could win Caesar's approval and make a military and political alliance with him, she could perhaps wrest power from her brother and become sole ruler. She returned covertly to Alexandria in order to meet Caesar. But banished from political life, Cleopatra had no resources and only one asset, herself. Therefore, her only way to regain power was sex. The story goes that Cleopatra paid one of her servants to roll her up in a carpet, carry her in a boat across the river to the palace of Alexandria, and carry her into Caesar's apartments. There, as the carpet was unraveled, Cleopatra literally revealed herself to Caesar. That was how Cleopatra and Caesar met for the first time in Egypt. This is one of history's most memorable and entrancing first encounters. The Roman sources luridly describe it as a wickedly seductive ploy by Cleopatra. But was it really just a cynical stratagem for romancing the most powerful man in the world? Would it really have happened like that? Paramedic Fred Galvin is going to use a model to examine the story. He suspects that the atmosphere inside the carpet would have been distinctly unromantic. We're going to be using a thermometer to measure the temperature inside the carpet and see how this affects her physiologically. 
Cleopatra's rag adventure took place in October 48 BC. Temperatures at this time of the year averaged in the mid-20s Celsius or mid-70s Fahrenheit, and it's estimated her servants carried her at least half a mile to Caesar's quarters. Fred is recreating this journey in a comparable daytime temperature. Within three minutes, the temperature inside the carpet is already rising rapidly. We have a temperature reading of 91 degrees Fahrenheit. It will continue to climb, I expect, as she remains in here and body heat continues to build. It's also a warm day. He's concerned about the effects of the buildup of heat on the model's health. Insulated by the carpet, a rise in her body temperature of just a couple of degrees can rapidly become dangerous. At that point, we begin to tax the body's ability to cool off, especially since she is uh, wrapped in this carpet and is not able to effectively use the air circulating around her to cool her off the way we normally would. So after approximately 20 minutes of testing, we are now at 96, 97 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to get quite stifling in there very soon. As Fred suspected, the temperature is rapidly approaching a dangerous level. It's getting really, really hot. It's getting harder to breathe steadily, and it feels like it's closing in on me more and more. Our temperature has now climbed to about uh, 99 degrees. So at this point, I would feel more comfortable uh, ending the experiment. The test shows that Cleopatra could possibly have stayed inside the carpet long enough to arrive at Caesar's residence still breathing, but it would have been a very unpleasant experience. She was clearly not putting herself through all this pain for an erotic encounter. In reality, the whole carpet story was part of an extravagant and desperate gamble for power. The story of Cleopatra unveiling herself in a carpet is not just a romantic tale of two lovers meeting. Think about Cleopatra's position. If she's discovered by her brother Ptolemy, she'll be killed. If she doesn't get Caesar on her side, she'll be killed. She has one chance only to get Caesar on her side and to make her bid for the throne of Egypt. She's delivering herself as a weapon. She knows Caesar has an eye for skirt, and even though he's supposed to be love-sated in his fifties, she is a young girl in the prime of her life, and she is going to do her best to take Caesar. For Cleopatra, it's sex or death. Cleopatra didn't care what she put herself through to seduce Caesar. Egyptologist Gail Gibson believes she may also have used subliminal sexual cues to get her man. The Greeks and the Romans, uh, who would often have light-colored eyes, use something called atropine. It comes from belladonna, and it makes your pupil get very, very big and black. That dilation is a sign of desire, and so it makes the person you're looking at realize you really want them. And if that didn't work, other cosmetics to simulate arousal were easily available. These lip glosses of uh, Cleopatra in her time would have been made of fat with either an ochre in them or a berry juice. Lips are always important for women because they look nice, but for Cleopatra they're even more important. Her lips have to be full and rich and luscious because after all, in orgasm, a woman's lips swell up and she wants to always look sexy and orgasmic. According to legend, Cleopatra was a great beauty. Seducing Caesar, a notorious womanizer, should have been easy. But at the archaeological museum of Nicopolis in Greece, rare coins minted during Cleopatra's reign reveal something rather unexpected. One of the key things about coins like this is that they're propaganda tools, they're bumper stickers for the people they portray because they're circulated all around the Roman world. In the ancient world, coins often bore the most accurate portraits of rulers, and these coins reveal a surprise. This is a coin of Cleopatra, and it's quite realistic, as is the style of the times. And you can see that despite the fact she's supposed to be a beauty of legend, she actually looks quite ugly. This view is echoed by the Roman writer Plutarch, who asserts quite emphatically that she was not a beautiful woman. Computer imaging can now allow the face of Cleopatra to be reconstructed.
As she and Caesar began their steamy affair, this is probably what Cleopatra actually looked like. So if she didn't entrap Caesar with her drop-dead gorgeous looks, how did she accomplish one of history's great seductions? It doesn't necessarily follow that you have to be beautiful to be good in bed. Um, and we know from ancient sources um, that it was her personality, her ability to converse in multiple languages simultaneously um, that was her charm. When she entered into a room, people were talking and she opened up her mouth. Everyone stopped, turned their heads to look at her. So a magnetic personality, great intellect, an ability to use the physical uh, characters that she had all contribute to making her an extraordinary, extraordinary individual. This is a story of seduction and politics, not love and loyalty. For Caesar, Cleopatra represented a legitimate ruler who would uphold his interests in Egypt. Conversely, Caesar was Cleopatra's only route to regaining the throne. What interests me is the fact that she sees herself as the equal to the most powerful man on earth. Cleopatra is very comfortable using her sexuality to gain and keep power. And it worked. Living with Caesar in Alexandria, Cleopatra could plan to settle the score with her brother-husband. Given their family history, this was never going to be pretty. Ptolemy was enraged to discover Cleopatra allied to Caesar. For three months, he and his sister Arsinoe laid siege to them inside the city walls. But taking on the most powerful force in the ancient world was not a good move for the boy king to make. In early 48 BC at the Battle of the Nile, Roman legions overwhelmed Ptolemy's forces. Thousands of his soldiers fled the field, and Ptolemy XIII drowned while trying to escape, the weight of his golden armor dragging him under the water. Her brother having died, Arsinoe was stripped of power and exiled to Ephesus in what is now Turkey. Caesar had won the war and Cleopatra had regained Egypt. They embarked on a victory voyage of celebration down the Nile. Success seemed complete and joy unbridled. But she was still 18 and he was 52. Was it such an idyll? The status of the relationship between Cleopatra and Caesar is unclear. On the one hand, in the year following their cruise down the Nile, Cleopatra accompanies Caesar back to Rome. He installs her in a villa. He puts a statue of her up in the city. Yet on the other hand, Caesar's also got his wife in Rome. Half of Rome doesn't like Cleopatra, as Cicero the orator says, all evil comes from Alexandria. And even Caesar never makes mention of their relationship in his official accounts of the war in Alexandria. Alexandria. The relationship, then, is never an official one. Cleopatra, though the mistress, is left out on a limb. Any other mistress might have elected to keep a low profile, but not Cleopatra. Nine months after her first momentous encounter with Caesar, she gave birth to a son, and she didn't hesitate to announce to everyone who the father was. Caesar never officially acknowledges paternity of the child. Instead, Cleopatra is left to do it with his name. The child's name is Ptolemy XV, Philopator, Philomator, Caesar, and his nickname becomes Caesarian, Little Caesar. With this, Cleopatra is cementing her position and her powerful role in Egypt. She has a son who's the child, supposedly, of the most powerful man in the Roman world. Cleopatra's malevolent brother-husband was dead. One of her sisters was also dead. She had Julius Caesar in her bed and little Caesarian on her lap. After the seduction, murder and maneuvering, it was all looking very promising for Cleopatra. However, the volatile nature of Roman politics was about to shatter her happiness. On the 15th of March 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated. Cleopatra's perfect world came crashing down around her ears. 
It must have been very difficult to be riding uh, the crest of an enormous wave uh, that would never break, basically, and uh, then to find uh, all of a sudden the news coming to you that uh, the man on whom you hung all of your hope, your partner in life, uh, was brutally cut down as Caesar was assassinated. I'm sure that Cleopatra was absolutely devastated, but she was quick to act. And that action was typically brutal. With Caesar gone, she was at risk from any pretender to the throne of Egypt. Her nearest rival was her last remaining brother, the 13-year-old Ptolemy XIV. He had never appeared to be a threat to her, but soon after the murder of Caesar, he mysteriously disappears from the historical record. Her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, disappears from the Egyptian sources. They give us no clue as to what happened to him. But if we turn to the Roman sources, a historian called Josephus tells us that Cleopatra might have had a hand in his murder. And what's more, Josephus also indicates that she might have poisoned him. It also seems to be part of an emerging pattern of a great attraction between Cleopatra and poisoning people. She's rumored to have practiced on prisoners to find out which was the most fast affected, and even later in her life on her own servants. Could Cleopatra really have poisoned her brother? She had the motive, she probably had the opportunity, but did she have the means? A toxicologist can answer that. Cleopatra had many poisons available to her. She would have all the botanicals as well as some of the famous metals like arsenic. So there's no question she would have had easy access. The first possibility is rhododendron, a potent toxin that flourished in the wild in Cleopatra's time. But Dr. Erickson rules it out. It would take a large amount of rhododendron to really do something diabolical or to kill someone. A more likely candidate is an extract of the plant henbane. Henbane is a very interesting plant. Cleopatra would have had access to this because the cosmetics and makeup were very important for her. It was part of her royalty, her beauty, and many of the cosmetics had poisons in them, but it was a small enough amount where it really didn't cause total body poisoning. If henbane got into the system, you start getting very agitated. Then your heart starts getting tachycardic, meaning a rapid heart rate. Then you have a seizure and a convulsion, and if it's a large enough dose, you can cause death. It's probably not a good way to actually kill someone quickly. So death from henbane was slow, and not ideal if you wanted to get rid of someone fast. That leaves aconite, an extract of the highly toxic plant monkshood. This is something that a small amount can be very lethal. The effects of aconite on the body is quite demonstrable and quite devastating. The symptoms of aconite poisoning are vomiting and diarrhea, and the poison has a rapidly lethal effect by causing massive heart and respiratory failure. It's hard to detect. You could put it in drink, you could put it in food. It is widely accessible. It was very popular during the times of Cleopatra. This seems to be, although there's no accurate writing saying what she used on her brother, but this would have been a perfect choice. The ancients referred to aconite as the queen of all poisons. What better choice for Cleopatra than the queen of all poisons? It would have been a simple matter for Cleopatra to slip some aconite to her brother in a potion. And it was the kind of thing she might be tempted to do. She was a politically ambitious woman. That was the dark side of her character. Her paramount concern was her own political survival. And her brother was therefore expendable. Cleopatra's psychological profile is looking dubious. Cleopatra's killing of a close family relative, her brother, is clear evidence of psychopathic behavior, killing without guilt or remorse. Cleopatra had eliminated her brother, but without Caesar to underwrite her status, she was still vulnerable. To retain her authority as ruler, she needed a new Roman alliance. Seduction had worked for her before. Why change a winning formula? She decided on 42-year-old Mark Antony, one of Caesar's most able generals. 
The Roman Empire was at this point split between West and East, and Mark Antony controlled the Eastern Empire. Cleopatra studied her new target. She wants to maintain a strong relationship with the Roman Empire to ensure her place on the throne. She will do whatever it takes to impress Antony. Cleopatra needed to pull out all the stops to extend her ten-year rule as Queen of Egypt. It was her second moment of destiny on the Nile. Their first meeting is legendary. She's about 28 years old and in the prime of her life. Cleopatra creates a grand spectacle. She arrives by boat. The stern is covered in gold, the oars are dipped in silver, perfume is in the air, and she is dressed as Aphrodite. When they do meet, sparks fly. The meeting marked the beginning of a legendary love affair, fueled by a high-octane combination of sex, power politics, and perhaps love. Everything in the story of Cleopatra and Mark Antony was exotic and extraordinary. Cleopatra and Mark Antony are extremely competitive with one another, always trying to outdo the other. And the story goes that one time Cleopatra boasts to Mark Antony, I can spend 10 million sesterces in one dinner. That's like a hundred million dollars. Now Cleopatra owns two large pearls, and she takes one pearl, puts it in a glass of vinegar where it dissolves, and she drinks it. She's just consumed one hundred million dollars in one glass. Dissolving a pearl in vinegar and drinking it is one of the most extravagant episodes of Cleopatra's career. It was used by the Romans to illustrate the depths of her decadence. But did it happen? Can the Roman authors be trusted? So now we're doing a uh, recreation of, of what we think may have happened. We're going to see if a pearl does in fact dissolve in the vinegar. And now we will take this modern culture pearl. And this is the big moment. She drops it in. One can see that there is a reaction going on at the very bottom and on the surface of the pearl. Very slowly carbon dioxide is being generated and when the bubble grows large enough, we'll see a lone bubble. There we go up to the top. Very slowly the surface of that is being corroded as it dissolves and reacts and with the acetic acid and the carbon dioxide bubbles come to the surface. The experiment works, but dissolving the pearl proves a slow process. So it can do nothing else, I think, but lead us to doubt the whole concept of being able to dissolve a pearl to where one would be able to drink it as a neutral solution. The process is far too slow to fit the story of a glamorous dinner party trick. It appears the Roman commentators had become carried away in their desire to demonize Cleopatra. There's no doubt about it. Cleopatra is a seductress. Her life is extremely excessive. But this story says more about the Roman authors and their attempts to write an engaging anecdote than it does about telling the truth. But one thing they did report correctly was that Cleopatra and Antony had embarked on a truly passionate affair. The lovers descended into a relationship steeped in a heady broth of power and sex that would eventually drown them both. Cleopatra and Mark Antony were the ultimate power couple of the ancient world. It suited Cleopatra perfectly. Cleopatra is a woman of drama. She doesn't do anything on a small scale. It is exactly the same thing she does to Caesar it coming out of a rug. They are grandstanding to gain the attention of the man she needs to be able to pull in on her side. But Mark Antony also became the great love of Cleopatra's life. There's this absolutely unbelievable carnal bond between these two. You talk about the greatest love story in history, and it has to be the intimacy of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. And it's, the electricity is just unbelievable. The relationship was as much about politics as about sex. Cleopatra and Antony together controlled the Roman imperial territories in the east that stretched from Armenia to Libya. I would characterize Cleopatra and Mark Antony's relationship as one that lust for power and the energy in the bedroom spills out into the political arena. Antony's eastern Roman provinces combined with Cleopatra's Egypt together created a vast power base. But Cleopatra always ensured that Egypt was hers alone.
The rear wall of the Temple of Dendera is a giant billboard proclaiming to the Egyptian people that Cleopatra is the sole ruler of their world. And we know that because according to Egyptian convention, the most important figure is the figure that is left most as the spectator faces the wall. And here on a monumental colossal scale, we have Cleopatra occupying that left hand most position by herself. The temple wall at Dendera testifies to the fact that Egypt was governed by Cleopatra in her own right. This idealized carving of the queen not only portrays her as unrealistically beautiful, it also shows that she carries the divine authority of the goddess Isis. Isis in the first century is the universal goddess. She ensures cosmic harmony and universal domination. Cleopatra is her regent on earth, so Isis conveys to Cleopatra universal sovereignty over the mortal world over which Cleopatra rules. And the two act as together, the Queen of Heaven and the Queen of Earth. Out of the brutal and uncertain world of her childhood, Cleopatra had created a stable power base from which she ruled Egypt as its sole monarch. This had been achieved only by the systematic elimination of her siblings, but one remained alive, her younger sister, Arsinoe. Cleopatra and Arsinoe were sisters, but they were also dangerous rivals for the throne of Egypt. Throughout their lives, they were competing against one another for the power that came with being the pharaoh in Egypt. While Arsinoe lived, Cleopatra's position would never be secure. There could only be one course of action. 41 BC, Ephesus, Turkey. Arsinoe was living in exile in a religious establishment that by ancient tradition guaranteed her protection. Cleopatra couldn't hurt her there, but Mark Antony could. So Cleopatra demanded a show of allegiance from her lover in the form of a murder. The sanctity of a temple complex was irrelevant to her. It was here on the steps of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus that Mark Antony, the lover of Cleopatra, came to murder Arsinoe, Cleopatra's own sister, on Cleopatra's orders in a crime that scandalized the whole of Rome. And there's new evidence to reinforce the story that Cleopatra's sister really did die here. Archaeologists believe they found Arsinoe's tomb. It dates from the right time, contained the corpse of a noblewoman, and is decorated with Egyptian motifs. There was only one high-ranking Egyptian woman in Ephesus at the time the body was placed in this tomb. Having murdered Arsinoe, Cleopatra had defeated her final rival for the throne. She was now sole ruler. She had won the game of survival in the Ptolemaic dynasty. And with Mark Antony at her side, her future now looked secure. But Cleopatra was sliding deeper into depravity. When Cleopatra's brother is murdered, perhaps it's just political. But with the murder of another close family relative, her sister, to me, as a psychiatrist, we see a pattern of clear psychopathic behavior. But in Rome, Octavian, the leader of the Western Empire, was stirring up opposition to the alliance of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Antony, he insisted, was in thrall to the evil queen. He'd clearly gone native. To the proud Romans who thought themselves superior to everyone, this was unforgivable. War became inevitable. Historian Mike Ibeji has come to Actium in Greece, scene of the decisive naval engagement of the war. Octavian had sold the conflict to the Roman public as a necessary confrontation between Rome and the dangerous foreign threat, Cleopatra. This was the point when Octavian cemented Cleopatra's reputation as a whore queen. The worse he portrayed her, the more justified his war would appear. It was the perfect excuse for Octavian to crush Cleopatra and Antony and so take control of the whole empire himself. War breaks out in 31 BC and 
Anthony's wrong-footed right from the start. A surprise move by Octavian traps him here in the Bay of Actium. Actium lies on the western shore of Greece at the junction of two worlds. To the west was Rome, to the south Egypt. Whoever won the day here could unite the two. There's a deadlock for weeks, and then Anthony finally breaks the deadlock by sailing out with his warships for battle. And his warships are much, much bigger and heavier than Octavian's. So Octavian's fleet backs out into the open sea, where their speed maneuverability will give them the advantage. Octavian had gained the upper hand, and he pressed home his advantage with speed. The situation at Actium was now desperate for Antony and Cleopatra. Surrounded and outnumbered, they couldn't possibly win. In the heat of battle, Cleopatra decided to save her own skin. And the story goes that as the battle unfolds, Cleopatra, she smashes through the center, hoists her sails, and sails hell for leather for Egypt. And Antony, poor desperate sap, basically goes running after her, leaving most of his navy in the lurch. It wasn't one of the Egyptian queen's finer moments. The Battle of Actium turns against her. She abandons Mark Antony. Her self-preservation trumps any loyalty she has to her lover. The defeat at Actium was a disaster for Cleopatra. It was the beginning of the end for her. Octavian built a temple overlooking the bay to celebrate his victory. He well realized that this battle was the turning point of the campaign and that he was on the verge of taking control of the whole empire. He'd just got to tidy up the loose ends of his defeated opponents before taking the prize. From this moment, Cleopatra and Antony were running for their lives. And really, I feel quite sorry for Cleopatra, because she never ever really felt able to operate as a woman within her own right. She always felt she had to attach herself to the next Roman bigwig to come along. And of course, in the end, she attached herself to the wrong man and was doomed to fall with him. Cleopatra and Antony fled to Egypt and took refuge within the fortified city walls of Alexandria. It was only a matter of time before Octavian caught up with them. By 30 BC, Octavian is at the very gates of Alexandria. Mark Antony commits suicide, dying in the arms of Cleopatra. She is said to weep like a woman who has lost the most important thing in her life. It was probable that Octavian would drag Cleopatra back to Rome in chains, parade her through the streets, and then publicly execute her. That was the Roman way with high-ranking captives, and there was no reason to think he would treat her differently. Cleopatra had no options left. It was time for the actress's final performance. According to the Roman authors who reported the event, she ended her life as she'd lived it, dramatically. They say she killed herself by means of a lethal snake bite. A knife would have been just too predictable. But is the story true? Or just another tall tale like the dissolved pearl? A reptile expert will investigate the story of Cleopatra's suicide. Could she turn a snake into a deadly weapon? Or is that just too far-fetched? In North Africa, two poisonous snakes were available to her. The viper and the cobra. First, the African viper. Vipers are usually ambush predators. They have extremely fast strikes. African vipers have uh, extremely toxic venom that breaks down tissues and causes necrosis of the skin, which is kind of like rotting of the tissues. It can just totally wreck your vital organs. Your blood doesn't clot, so you can die from hemorrhaging of the brain. Death by the bite of a viper would have been both slow and painful, not ideal. Is the Egyptian cobra a more likely candidate? Egyptian cobra can actually, in its venom glands that are right where its cheeks are, right behind his eye, can hold about 300 milligrams of venom. And the LD50, or the lethal dose for a human, is about 10 to 15. So this snake is capable of killing around 30 people. 
When a cobra bites a human, it injects a neurotoxic venom which attacks the nervous system. There have been people known to die from an Egyptian cobra within minutes after being bitten. If Cleopatra was going to die from a snake bite, the cobra was the least unpalatable alternative. But she still had to get it to bite her, and that's not as easy as it sounds. Snakes attack only when provoked. We're going to use this artificial limb to annoy the snake a little bit and touch it and see how easy it is to get it to bite this limb. You really have to agitate the snake or get it upset or you have to pick it right up. I'm applying a little more pressure now and you can see that it's actually flaring out like a cobra normally does. is now latched on and is trying to inject venom. Okay, if you look closely, you can see the snake actually lost a tooth in the process, and you can also see that there's some venom on the, the hand there. That is a deadly enough amount of venom right there to kill a few people on the finger there. Provoking a snake into biting her might not have been the most dignified end, but if Cleopatra was determined enough to kill herself in this manner, she would probably have succeeded. Cleopatra knows she's going to die. She opts for a dramatic death by snake bite. To me as a psychiatrist, this shows theatricality as a central aspect of her personality. Cleopatra held control of Egypt for two decades. She rose to power on the backs of the sudden and nasty death of her siblings. And she maintained her authority by ruthless political skill and her super weapon, sex. She was flamboyant, smart, and very, very dangerous. Where does such behavior place Cleopatra on a psychopathic scale that compares her with other tyrants in history? Most of her actions are goal-driven, like those of Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan, but there's a darker aspect to her behavior. Cleopatra shows significant psychopathic behavior. She kills her brother, she orders the death of her sister in order to retain power. This behavior moves her towards more psychopathic personalities like Caligula and Attila the Hun. But that's just one aspect of her profile. She was an exhibitionist who loved being sent to stage, and she stayed there by putting on grand spectacles, like being rolled out of a carpet for Julius Caesar, by her exquisitely performed seduction of Mark Antony, and her melodramatic death from snake venom. By these acts, Cleopatra exhibits signs of histrionic personality disorder, a deep psychological need to be admired by a large audience. Cleopatra scores high on a histrionic personality scale. Her theatricality, the costumes of her as a goddess, sailing down the Nile, even how she's presented to Caesar in a rug, her death via snake bite in a very dramatic fashion, all speak to this aspect of her personality. So who in history has a similar personality profile? Cleopatra reminds me of Catherine the Great, the ruler of Russia. They're both women playing in a man's world. They're both charming and intelligent. They're both quite theatrical. And when needed, they're both cold-hearted and ruthless. These personality traits make Cleopatra one of history's great survivors. Her methods may have been unattractive, but they worked, at least for a time. What she couldn't know is that she was destined to be the last pharaoh of Egypt. After her death, Rome moved in. Magnificent Egypt became a mere province of the empire. The land that Cleopatra aspired to rule, a great civilization dating back thousands of years, was gone forever.